The reading this morning is from Luke chapter 4, starting at verse 1. The temptation of Jesus. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit in the desert, where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing during those days, and at the end of them he was hungry. The devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, tell this stone to become bread. Jesus answered, It is written, Man does not live on bread alone. The devil led him up to a high place and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. And he said to him, I will give you all their authority and splendor, for it is being given to me, and I can give it to anyone I want. So if you worship me, it will all be yours. Jesus answered, It is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve only him. The devil led him to Jerusalem and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the Son of God, he said, throw yourself down from here. For it is written, he will command his angels concerning you to guard you carefully. They will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus answered, it says, do not put the Lord your God to the test. When the devil had finished all this tempting, he left him until an opportune time. Thank you very much, and good morning, everybody. I'm not sure whether we've yet been joined by the people on live stream, but if we have, um, a warm welcome, I'm told we have. So a warm welcome um, and good morning to those of you watching online as well. I'm Nick. I'm one of the church members here, and it's my great privilege this morning to go on a little journey with you into the desert to explore this passage from Luke that Anne has read to us about the temptation of Jesus in the desert. If you're an older church member, then you might remember a song that used to be sung in church and also, I think, sung at church youth groups and on youth camps, a song called, Do You Want a Pilot? Anybody remember that? I'm getting one or two nods from here and there. Do you want a pilot? Signal then to Jesus. Do you want a pilot? Bid him come on board, for he will safely guide across the oceans wide until you reach at last the heavenly harbor. So a song full of um, lots of good Christian imagery. And the underlying idea, of course, is that when a large ship is coming into an unfamiliar port, the captain of the ship needs a local pilot to steer the ship into the harbor so that it doesn't run aground and doesn't hit any hidden obstacles. You'll be very pleased to know I'm not going to try and sing the song this morning, and I'm, I'm, the band will, I'm sure, be very pleased to know that I'm not going to ask them to play it either. But the song did have some actions. And uh, one of the actions involved, um, m involved um, scanning the horizon with some imaginary binoculars looking for, uh, looking for the pilot. And I have a very distinct memory of this because when there was an occasion when we were singing this song at the church that we used to attend in London, and uh, it was a morning when I was on the rotor to take up the offertory collection. And so the plate was going round the congregation. And when everybody had put their money in, as the song was being sung, I took the plate up to the front, handed it to the minister, turned round to go back to my seat to be faced by about 150 people all training their binoculars on me. <laughs> Which I have to say was a very surreal experience. Um, I wanted to um, share that slightly daft story with you because I wanted to begin this morning by talking about binocular vision. A pair of binoculars, you see, has two lenses mounted in parallel. And if you look through either lens, then you would probably see the object that you're pointing the binoculars at. But only when you look through both lenses and focus them together, does the thing that you are looking at come sharply into focus. We're going to be thinking this morning about this fairly extraordinary episode in the life of Jesus when he was 
led into the desert, into the wilderness, to be tempted by the devil. And I want to suggest to you this morning that a good way to get beneath the surface of the story and see what it's really all about is to view it using binocular vision. And the two lenses through which I'm going to invite you to look at the story are firstly that Jesus was a man. But secondly, second lens, that he was also God. The person led out into the desert to be tempted was wholly human, but at the same time, wholly divine. And if we keep both of those quite similar but distinct ideas in mind as we, as we, as we read the story, then I hope that we'll see more clearly what's going on. So first of all, Jesus is undoubtedly a man. Luke ensures that we understand this. The story that Anne read to us this morning from Luke chapter 4 follows on from what you might think is a slightly boring part of Luke 3, which is the genealogy of Jesus. Now, actually, I personally, I love Luke's gospel. I think it's probably my favorite gospel, and the reason is because it's so carefully put together. Every part of Luke seems to be in the right place in order to highlight and uh, emphasize the significance of what he's saying. And even the genealogy is significant because unlike the genealogy in Matthew's gospel, which starts with Abraham, Luke's genealogy goes all the way back to Adam. Jesus is a descendant of Adam. Luke couldn't really make it any clearer that he's emphasizing Jesus' human nature. Now, of course, Adam, like Jesus, was tempted by the devil. Adam and Eve were told not to eat the fruit of a particular tree in the Garden of Eden. Along came the devil in the guise of the serpent and said, yeah, you don't need to worry. Nothing will happen. Eat the fruit. You won't die. Instead, you'll, you'll get knowledge and you'll become like God. Similar temptations, if you like, to those <clears throat> experienced by Jesus. But unlike Jesus, Adam gave in to temptation and the devil succeeded. Adam's disobedience, as we know, led to the great divide between God and his creation that Jesus came to heal. And Jesus' human nature, as we'll see in a bit uh, later, is important to the role that Jesus had in undoing the wrong that was done by Adam's disobedience. To the extent that in some parts of the New Testament, in, in 1 Corinthians 15, for example, we see Jesus referred to as the last Adam and also to the second Adam. 1 Corinthians 15 says, the first man was of dust, the second man is of heaven. Jesus, the perfect man, comes to undo the damage done by the disobedience of the first man. As a, as a man, Jesus experienced human feelings and limitations. He'd not eaten in the desert for 40 days, so we're told that he was hungry. Not surprising, you might say, if you don't eat for 40 days, sure, you're going to be hungry. But it's only not surprising because we think of Jesus as a man. If we thought of him as some sort of celestial being like an angel, then actually, why would he be hungry? But he was. He was hungry, and no doubt he was tired and thirsty as well. And like us humans, he had other limitations. He couldn't, notably, an inability to fly. Hence the impact of the devil's invitation to him to throw himself off the highest point of the temple. So even though Jesus may have been God, his earthly life was subject to many of the same limitations as we are. Now, one of the ways in which this passage is often used by preachers to explore um, 
is to explore what lessons we can learn about how to deal with temptation. And in that context, what we often say is, well, how did Jesus deal with temptation? Answer is, he quoted scripture to the devil. And without doubt, it's a good lesson to learn that if we have good knowledge of the Bible, and if we preferably commit some key parts of it to memory, then that will serve as well when temptations come. What we often don't consider when we think about the passage is where in the scriptures these passages come from. As it happens, they all come from the book of Deuteronomy. Man does not live by bread alone, is Deuteronomy 8.3. Worship the Lord your God and serve him only, Deuteronomy 6, 13. And do not put the Lord your God to the test, Deuteronomy 6, verse 16. The book of Deuteronomy actually begins with these words. These are the words Moses spoke to all Israel in the desert. Jesus is in the desert. When the people of God were wandering in the desert, as Jesus is here, the book of Deuteronomy represented the rules that God wanted them to live by. And in Deuteronomy 11, God himself summarizes what he wants his people to do with this set of principles and rules that he's given them. This is what God says in Deuteronomy 11. Fix these words of mine in your hearts and minds. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Teach them to your children, talking about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates so that the days and the days of your children may be many in the land that the Lord swore to give to your ancestors, as many as the days that the heavens are above the earth. So these rules and principles that are found in Deuteronomy were handed down by God to his people. They're woven into the life of Israel. They're an integral part of what it meant to be a person part of the people of God. So by quoting these particular verses, Jesus is identifying with the nation of Israel. He's identifying with God's people expressed on earth. And when we go, when we go through our, our own wilderness experience, we know that Jesus identifies with us too. He's been there before. We can be sure that he understands. God chose, in the person of Jesus, to take on the limitations of living a human life because it was important that Jesus be tested in the desert. That testing was a preparation for the ministry that was to come and the sacrifice that Jesus had to make. Jesus was a man, but importantly, he was a man who put his trust in his heavenly Father. To trust God is the very opposite of putting God to the test, as the devil invited Jesus to do. Now, the devil knew <clears throat> that Jesus had, in part, human nature, because the devil used uh, Jesus' human weaknesses as a way to try and tempt him, turn the stones into bread. But the devil also knew that Jesus shared the divine nature. And he tries to use that too to taunt Jesus. If we go back to chapter 3, which I think Matt spoke about last week, you'll remember that after Jesus' baptism, the dove, the, the spirit descended on Jesus like a dove. And a voice was heard saying, You are my son, whom I love. Well, two of the devil's taunts begin with the phrase, if you are the Son of God. We're beginning now to look at the story through the other lens of the binoculars. The picture comes more sharply into focus as we see the nature 
of the devil's taunts. The devil is trying to undermine Jesus' sense of mission by questioning what it means to be the Son of God and even to question the sort of saviour, the sort of messiah that he's supposed to be. If God's plan is to establish a kingdom with Jesus as king, why doesn't Jesus just turn the stones into bread and demonstrate his power over all the world as the devil invites him to do? The fact is that Jesus' accession to the throne of heaven is not intended to be achieved by seizing power, not by force, but by sacrifice and humility. And this is where we really, in a way, get to the heart of the story. Because if we focus for a moment on Jesus' divine nature, then we can see that all of these various human limitations, like being hungry and thirsty, not being able to fly, those were limitations on his power and his sovereignty that God had chosen to accept. He'd willingly allowed himself to become weak and vulnerable by coming to earth as a man. Why? Because that was how his great plan of salvation for the world was intended to work. God's plan to reverse the effect of the sin that Adam had committed, the disobedience of Adam, God's plan was that he would come to earth as a vulnerable human being and in human form pay the ultimate sacrifice to redeem the world and to forgive mankind. So when the devil tempts him, what does it mean that the devil is trying to taunt God himself? It's a spiritual confrontation of the utmost significance. What the devil's effectively saying is, you don't need to do this, God. You don't need to allow yourself to be limited by all these human features. Just go back to being God. Just have absolute power over everything. But if God, in the person of Jesus, had given in to those temptations, the great plan of salvation would have been ruined. If Jesus had simply seized control, there'd have been no sacrifice, no Calvary, no obedience, no redemption, no communion, and no glorious resurrection. Just before we think momentarily about Easter, one, one final thing to say. Some of you might have found my um, little illustration at the beginning about binocular vision um, a bit unsatisfying, a bit dissatisfying in, in one way. So you might have thought, well, we've thought about Jesus, the person of Jesus, and we've thought about the intentions of God the Father, but there's a third person to the, to the Godhead, isn't there? God is not two persons, God is three. Well, actually, we don't have to go very far, do we, to see the Holy Spirit at work in this story. In Luke 3, the Holy Spirit descended on Jesus in bodily form like a dove. At the start of chapter 4, Jesus, we're told, was full of the Holy Spirit. And then he was led by the Spirit in the desert. So we can see that right here at the start of Jesus' ministry, at a point where God's plan of salvation was about to be unfolded, but could have been derailed. Instead, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are all united in ensuring that the devil was seen off and that the plan moved forward towards Calvary. So we're in a time of Lent at the moment. We're preparing for Easter. And in a couple of weeks, on Good Friday, there'll be time for solemn reflection on the cross, on that moment, that extraordinary act of will by Jesus when he gave himself for us. But on Easter Day, we'll celebrate the fact that Jesus rose from the dead. 
And that itself is a vindication, a proof that God's great plan of salvation for mankind has worked, has been effective. But if in the episode that we've read about today, Jesus had not held firm, if he'd given in to the devil's temptations, then the great plan would have been strangled at birth. I'm going to ask the band to come back and be ready because we're going to sing one more song before we move into, t into communion. Uh, and then Amanda will lead us through communion. But um, when, we, when we take communion, when we, when we celebrate communion and we remember the sacrifice that Jesus made for us, let's rejoice in our salvation. But perhaps also you might just want to take a moment to pause and remember that if Jesus had not been obedient when tested in the desert, then we wouldn't be here at all. Amen. <laughs>